of weeks, 12 Wednesday nights, 24 Bible doctrines. And if um, you signed up for it and forgot, they're meeting up in our Sunday school building. And if you're not sure where they're going to be, talk to one of the ushers. They're in the Fosse Chapel, the very back corner of our Sunday school building. And so if you if you are, have not gotten there, you're planning on being there and you forgot about it or whatever, you can run up there and catch them. But, um, and this is a good thing. It helps us know what the Bible says. So very important that we base our faith on the word of God. Now, as people are getting settled, um, just a quick review. Jesus comes and he offers himself as king. He comes to Israel. John chapter one says he came unto his own and his own received him not. That's kind of a summary of his life. But then it goes on in verse 12 of John 1, but as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So Jesus came to the Jew to offer himself as the Messiah. He came saying, I will be your king. And a lot of people say, well, what if he, the Jews would have accepted him or whatever? Uh, then the rapture would have happened. The tribulation would have happened. I don't know. Good grief. It would all happen right then, I guess. <laughs> uh, it didn't. That's the main thing. And um, they, uh, there's a lot of speculation, but I don't spend a lot of time speculating on what didn't happen. You know, these dumb people, can God make a rock bigger than he can lift up? Nobody can make stupid people who think of things like that. <clears throat> and what a bunch of crazies that God, the miracle of miracles, God so loved the world. So he came to Israel, offered himself as king. They rejected him. He, he gave sign after sign after sign validating his messianic authenticity, that he was the Messiah. There's no question that he was who he said he was. Uh, even the guards, as he hung on the cross and died, they said, surely this was the Son of God. They knew. Don't think those Pharisees, uh, Gamaliel, I think it was in one of the last meetings of the Pharisees said, don't you realize it's necessary that one die for the sins of the people? He knew the prophecies. They knew. They killed their Messiah because they didn't want him. That's the end of subject. They didn't want Jesus. And they didn't mind him healing some people. They didn't want, to, they didn't want him running things. They had, the, the Jewish leaders had a good scam going on. No different than America today. Um, there were plenty of, you see, the Bible says of Jesus, the common people heard him gladly. Doesn't that sound like America? You know, Brother, Brother Josh and I were at a home uh, this week of a family who's got a little four-year-old girl dying with a brain tumor. And um, when we got there, she was already unconscious, and they don't know how long she'll last, a day, a few days, or whatever. But, but um, not a family with a church background, but just good people. And there's a bunch of family from out of town there and just the most gracious, um, kind people. And, you know, the, that, that type of America, I mean, the grandpa and grandma had been to a Trump rally. They had a, they had a flagpole with an American flag in the front yard. They're just, and the one had a Cabela's T-shirt on, and they were going to the sportsman's warehouse when we got there. They're just, I said, you would fit in at our church just fine. And, uh, but the, the common people, They've got no problem with Jesus. And in America, the common people, the common people don't want to outlaw your Bible. Um, you have to go to a university and get stupidized. And once you've got enough stupidizing going on in your head and your brain's all been, you know, crystallized and warped and morphed. And then then you get that degree that says I've been officially stupidized. And um, and I think it's good that. Lenin killed 100 million of his own people or however many people he killed. And I'm for Hitler killing millions. And, and you get this communist thinking in their stupid head. But the common men, they'll hear this. They had no problem with me being a total stranger and Josh being a total stranger, walking in there, praying with him, talk with him. And he was talking to some over here. I was talking to some over there. Never met us in their lives. More than happy to hear the gospel, to talk about things that are eternal and that little girl's destiny and the common people heard Jesus and, 
And understand this, we ought to be praying for our leaders and we ought to be praying for our country because when the elite of Israel rejected Jesus, the condemnation came on the common people. 70 AD, Titus comes through and wipes out Israel and they said every tree on every road out leaving Jerusalem had a Jew crucified on it. You say, why'd they do that? I think God looked down and said, you crucified my son, you're going to be crucified. Story after story of the mayhem, the just a, the tragedy of first century Jerusalem and the Jews. And if you don't know the story of Masada, that's just one more of the many stories of, of the tragic fall of a city who said no to their Messiah. And so Jesus offered himself. The Jews said no. They rejected him. He died for our sins. Three days later, rose from the dead. He walked 40 days with the people of his people, with the believers, not with the religious elite. He walked 40 days. Then he ascended and he said, you go to the world and preach the gospel. And especially the apostles. And so Acts chapter 1 finds the apostles gazing up and Jesus rising up into the clouds. The angels come and say, this same Jesus who you saw, he's going to come in like manner right back here. And you go preach to the world. And again, our job's not to take care of us. We have somehow bought into this idea that I am here on earth to take care of me. You cannot find that in this book. I am here to sacrifice me. Romans 12, present your body a living sacrifice. Look at the apostles. They were abused, taken advantage of. Look at Jesus, lied about, slandered. And what did they do? They just kept on preaching Christ. And so the book of Acts is that message that Jesus is coming again. They're in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, started traveling to other countries, preaching the gospel. And there in Jerusalem, there were 3,000 saved. Then there were 5,000 saved. That's eight. And then the disciples were multiplied. The lowest thing you can multiply by, not logically, would be two. That means there's at least 16,000 believers. And that's just in the first five or six chapters of the book of Acts. And people are getting saved. Now, there's no Jewish, there's no, the Gentile is the non-Jew. There's no Gentile work going on yet. This is all Jews. And the Jews are getting saved. Priests are getting saved. Rabbis are getting saved. You know what? We get this idea that the Catholic priest up the road couldn't get saved. Oh, yeah, he could. Those, those guys up here on Orange Street, uh, those Buddhist monks, they could get saved. Now, either need, you need the gift of tongues or you need somebody that can speak Thai. But I've tried talking to them. We had some come to a funeral I did here. They came out of respect uh, for uh, Luke, I'm blank on his name now, but the, a good man up the street that came to our church just a little while before he went to heaven. Um, but uh, these, these guys were his neighbor, and they liked him, came, and they listened in English. I'm, I was praying God help them understand something. I don't know if they did. But, but uh, look, there's nobody beyond the, the power of the gospel. The New Testament story tells that. And, um, and then they, uh, uh, they began preaching. Remember the story in Acts chapter 8? There's a man of Ethiopia, clear down in Africa. And he comes up. He could have been an Ethiopian who got saved. And uh, don't, you remember, remember when Jesus said, uh, condemning the, the, the uh, Pharisees, he said, you'll compass, compass is a circle, you'll compass land and sea to make one disciple and then you make him twofold, twofold more the child of hell. Remember that? Well, obviously the Jews had evangelism. Really? Makes sense, right? You're all looking at me like it's Wednesday night. Um, so I'm trying to do a fast review here. Otherwise, it'll be a three-hour night. And uh, since I didn't eat any dinner, we can't have a three-hour night. Um, so this guy from Ethiopia, he could have been um, an, an Ethiopian man who got saved and through whatever means got saved, who became a Jew, not saved, and came to Jerusalem or 
he could have been a Jewish guy living down there because the Jews were scattered all over the world. And um, remember, um, Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer clear over in Babylon. And he wasn't Babylonian. He was a Jewish man who was over there. There were Jews scattered around the world in that day. But whatever the case, the, uh, he was the treasurer of Ethiopia under the queen. He came to Jerusalem and he heard the gospel, but that was a Jewish person for, for all practical purposes. We're going to assume he was a Jewish person, either a proselyte or a true Jew, didn't matter. But um, still, they're not getting out to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish people. So where we are in Acts chapter 10 tonight is we see them pushing over the line to the unusual. All right, so let's just, we're going to run through, and uh, we won't get through all of Acts 10. There's a lot in Acts 10. Now, this one more thing I forgot, Acts 7, Acts chapter 7. Stephen preached that key sermon in Acts chapter 7. It's very possible Jesus is rejected and he's crucified. He raises from the dead. Some days, weeks, months pass and Stephen preaches. So back there, the Jews, the Jewish leaders rejected the Messiah. Remember, it was the leader's decision. It wasn't the common man's. Stephen comes, and Stephen preaches to the Jewish leaders again. He wasn't out there on the seaside where Jesus was preaching to the fishermen. He wasn't in Nazareth or Capernaum, the common men's place. He was in Jerusalem, and he had a group of these Pharisees and religious leaders, and he preached through the Old Testament to these guys, and it's very likely that he gave the Jewish leadership one more chance. Will you trust Christ as the Messiah? And they, they took him out of town, threw rocks at him, and murdered him. Now, the key thing is this. From that point on, there's very little big stuff happen in Jerusalem. And you'll see, starting in this chapter, you'll see that, that uh, Joppa, Caesarea, and then Antioch, coastal Gentile cities become the place God works from. And it's like Acts 7 with Stephen. It was one last chance. And those Jewish leaders wanted no part of this Messiah. And so now um, God is going to bring uh, the gospel to the Gentiles. Let's look at Acts chapter 10, and we're just going to walk through a few verses. There was in a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion, century, hundred. So he was over a hundred soldiers, most likely, of the band, not like the Beatles or Rolling Stones. A band is a group, okay, called the Italian band. This group of soldiers were the Italian band, all right? Now, we better look at Caesarea. You guys got Caesarea somewhere in a map? Maybe, maybe not. I remembered to bring my own custom laser tonight. If you fall asleep, I will shine it on you. Not really. So Cornelius, a Gentile soldier, not a Jewish person. Look at verse 2. Oh, there we go. We got the map up there already. All right. <laughs> it's on. Yeah, there you go. You that are watching online, please pray. If I shoot somebody, it's not me. It is a, it is a visual uh, fraudulent thing. All right, let's read verse 2. As soon as you look away, it's going to come back. It's like the scary things that happen at night. You know, the things that go bump in the night. Verse 2, this Cornelius, don't even look up at the screen. Don't look. Look at your Bible. Acts 10, verse 2. If you're watching online, whatever you're looking at is fine. You don't count. The people in the auditorium, they're the ones that scare the map away. Verse 2. This guy was a devout man. So we're describing this unsaved guy, a devout man. Now look at the list. Devout, one that feared God with all his house. He gave much alms. Now alms are just giving to the poor. They're just caring for people. And he gave it to the people. He prayed to God always. That's four pretty incredible things. He was feared God with all his house. He gave alms. He prayed, he was devout, he prayed to God always. Look over to verse 4. And when he looked on him, he saw a, a vision. Um, um, he, he said, uh, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, thy prayers and thy alms are come for up for a memorial before God. 
God noticed this man's prayers and he noticed his giving to the poor. Remember, tithing is to the church. Alms are you just give away. That's why at one point Jesus said, when you do your alms, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. And so I'm giving whatever uh, to the Lord's work and the church is one thing. But I don't go down the street and find somebody poor and give him money. I go tell Matt, hey, I saw this poor guy. I gave him 50 bucks. Um, he says, you just lost your reward. And giving to the poor, just give. You don't want to embarrass the poor. want to be blessing to the poor. So, uh, so here's a guy, verse 2, devout, feared God, gave alms, and he prayed always. In verse 4, his prayers and his giving came up before God. Look down. Uh, let's see. Go down to verse 20, uh, 22. They said, Cornelius the centurion, he's a just man. That's the fifth thing about him, just. And he fears God. He's repeating what was in verse 2. And has a good report among the nation of the Jews. That's six character traits of this man. Devout, feared God, gave alms, prayed always. And then in verse 22, he was just. And he feared God. And he had a good reputation among the Jews. Look at verse 25. Now, we'll come back and read this. I want, to, I want to point out who we're talking about here. Verse 25, as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet to worship him. So we've got, that's a, this is a guy willing to humble himself before a Jew. The Romans occupied all of the Judean area. The Jews were nobody to the Romans. But he was humble enough to say, if you're bringing the, the news of salvation I'm falling on my face to worship you. Of course, Peter wouldn't let him worship him. That shows Peter was not the first pope because no real Christian would let anybody bow down to them. All right. Now, so let's look at the map. Um, here's the Dead Sea. There's the Jordan River. There is the, the Sea of Galilee. Jesus was born in, in Bethlehem right outside Jerusalem. But they went and he's then, of course, they fled to Egypt. And then they came back up. And he was raised in Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, right about there between Ptolemus and uh, the Sea of Galilee. And this area uh, up, up through here um, where the disciples were from, all of this. The Apostle Paul, he's in Jerusalem and he's on his way to Damascus. And that's where he sees the vision in Acts chapter 8. Um, and he, he sees a vision of Jesus and he falls down and he gets saved there. And uh, remember, he goes out into Arabia for a short time, goes back to Damascus. He's there for three years with the disciples. And the churches had rest all through this area. There were churches already started and the gospel being preached. We read last week about Philip and Philip left from Jerusalem. He, he was preaching up here in Samaria. And God says, go down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And in chapter eight, he meets the Ethiopian man. He goes from uh, Jerusalem to Gaza, uh, to Gaza. Um, and then he goes over to a little a little village here. We can't find it's on the other maps, but he ends up over in Joppa. Now there's Joppa, Caesarea, and up here is Antioch. Antioch and Caesarea and Joppa. These are key places we're going to be looking at in in a few minutes and maybe next week. So you can get rid of the map. People have an idea where it is. All right, let's go back over to Acts chapter ten now, and you can get all the lights on so I can see. Um, so we've got this man, verse 2, devout, feared God. Verse 3, he saw a vision. He saw a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day. So 6 o'clock would be the first hour. Noon would be the, would be the, 6 would be the first hour. Noon would be the sixth hour. So 3 in the afternoon would be the ninth hour. And an angel came to him saying, Cornelius, verse 4, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, thy prayers and thy alms are come up for a memorial before God. And I'll just stop for a moment here and repeat this. If an unsaved man would fear God and be devout and pray and give to others in such a way that God notices his prayer life and his giving, does he not notice yours? He does notice our giving. God does notice you praying. And it does matter. Uh, I'll tell you, we, we have gotten way, way too much atheists in our church. 
In our heads we believe in God. In our heart we may have accepted Christ. But like the songwriter wrote, ere you left your room this morning, did you think to pray? In the name of Christ our Savior, did you sue for loving favor as a shield today? Uh, prayer lifts burdens. Okay. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to him in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. I want to challenge you. Become a people of prayer. Pray alone. Pray with your family. Come and pray in church. Mrs. Goddard's got a group that meets uh, Thursday mornings, 815. They meet up here in this, in this schoolroom. And just for a time of prayer, we need prayer. And do we not care about our country? And you might say, well, you know, I pray on my own. Well, that's fine too, but there's something about prayer meetings in the Bible. There's something to be said about the people of God gathering together. There's power in prayer. Jesus said, where two or more are gathered together, there am I in the midst. It does matter that we pray. It matters that we pray with others. Men, we have a prayer meeting Saturday night, 7 o'clock. And, uh, and I'll tell you, if we, if we were being jailed and burned at the stake, prayer meetings would be full. Or not. I think they would. I'd hate to think they wouldn't. Um, if we were having to, to hide from people shooting us and imprisoning us, don't you think we'd be getting together in people's house to pray? I'd find the person with the most food in the cupboard, and I'd go stay at their house. Because uh, you're not going to be able to buy groceries without the mark of the vax. All right. I'm just teasing, although it could be true. Um, so verse five, God, the angel gives Cornelius instruction, send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. So Cornelius is in the city of Caesarea, Caesar, Caesarea. That city was built in honor of the Caesar. And that is, it was like the Vegas of today. Caesarea, uh, you can still see it. Um, come to my Sunday school class, you'll see it maybe next week or the week after. There was a, a, a stadium like bleachers. It would seat thousands. They had a giant, like a horse track for chariot races. They had a beautiful harbor that was built. They had a, a amphitheater that would seat thousands where there were concerts. I preached there once. Not to thousands, but anyway, um, that it, it's all it's still there. They had an aqueduct. They brought water from the mountains so there would be fresh water down into Caesarea. Not a Jewish city. It was a Gentile city in honor of Caesar. And so uh, Cornelius, a Gentile, a non-Jewish soldier, lived there. He sent men to Joppa down along the coast looking for this guy named Simon, and that he would tell him, look at verse 7. And when the angel spake, to Cornelius, spake unto Cornelius, who was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier. So how many did he call? Three. Just a thought. Keep that in mind. Seeing if you're awake. There are significant things. All right. You'll see it. Verse 8. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. Now, Joppa might have been... Um, 50 miles, it was a pretty good distance, maybe further. I'm just off the top of my head trying to remember. So verse 9, on the morrow, as they went on their journey, they drew nigh unto the city. Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Sixth hour would be what? Noon. They're getting ready to have lunch. They're going to have some uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, some potato chips, and uh, mom's going to put out some carrot sticks, but no one's going to eat them. And... Um, they're just going to eat potato chips, all right? So um, verse 10, he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell in a trance and he saw heaven open. Now, you can read this, uh, but let me tell you this quick story. He's, he's in a trance. He's kind of a, in a spiritual uh, asleep, but he knows what's going on. And this giant sheet, it's like a bed sheet, like a parachute upside down, comes floating down from the sky right in front of him. And it's filled with all of the animals. If you look in Leviticus 11, it's filled with all the animals you couldn't eat. Pigs, shrimp, lobster, camels, I don't know, horses, uh, buzzards. I have no idea. It just said all manner. All right. There's all kinds of forbidden meat. And, uh, and it comes down 
and uh, the whoever God says, arise, Peter, slay and eat. And Peter says, not so, Lord, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. Let's look at that. Peter said, I'm not going to eat this stuff. So uh, look at verse uh, 12, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things. There were roaches in there and beetles and all kinds of things, fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. We're going to stop just for a minute. What was Peter's occupation? Fisherman. Wasn't a preacher, right? Just a regular working man. He never violated his faith. What, what has happened to Christianity? That we push it as far as we can. I, I mean, I've read this story hundreds of times, I guess. And I was studying through this week, and he said, I've never never ate anything unclean i mean he must not have been a toddler <laughs> toddlers put all kind of unclean things in their mouths <laughs> it's just amazing i just i just want you to grasp that where is the devotion of the people of god to the word of god that says you know what the bible says don't i don't period I love that. Just, and it isn't interesting that that's one of the men God chose to represent him. And I can say to you young people, you cannot be too clean. You cannot walk too straight. You teenagers, you, 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 you say, well, you know, I'll be the odd one. Yeah, so was Peter. The odd one that got picked. And I just thank God for people who will go to the extreme and walk over the edge for holiness and righteousness. And by the way, it will make you unpopular because this world tries to justify their booze and their gambling and their nightclubs and their, their promiscuous lifestyle. And they want to justify their carnality. Um, you know, go to church once or twice a year whenever you feel like it. No, you know what? God said, don't forsake the assembly of your people. He said, don't forsake the assembling of the saints. It's just, anyway. So let's go on. That, that's just... Uh, I just I just think that's a great thing. Verse 15, and the, vo the voice spake to him again. No, oh, wait, wait, wait. The vo the verse 13, we can't go any further. There came a voice saying, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord. Isn't Peter the one who always argues with Jesus? <laughs> Jesus is with the disciples and he says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. The Romans are going to arrest me and they're going to kill me. And Peter says, no way, over my dead body. Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus is meeting with the disciples. Um, the Last Supper, you're all going to betray me. No, 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 not me. Any of you have one of those kids in your house? Don't be too hard on them. They might end up being a Peter. You know, they either, they're either going to not shut up for the devil or not shut up for Jesus. Okay, so just hope they pull over to the right. But uh, good, good lessons there. He, he had no problem speaking up and speaking out of turn. I'm surprised Jesus didn't slap him. But anyway, I bet his daddy did. But anyhow, I wonder if he, I bet he's the baby of the family. <laughs> I was, you know, I'm just telling you, the baby of the family tends to be a little more outspoken. Uh, <laughs> Verse 15, and the voice spoke to him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And ready, verse 16, and this was done how many times? Thrice, that means three, thrice, three times. What did we meet three earlier? Three what? Three men, three what kind of men? Gentile men, three what, what are Gentiles clean or unclean? Unclean, got three Gentiles, three unclean Gentile dogs. And we got three times that sheet came down and said, eat. No, I don't do that. And, yeah, you better. No, I'm not. I don't do that. Yes, you better. Okay. Uh, and then he had some pork chops, mashed potatoes and gravy, some deep fried shrimp. That was great. Now, verse 17, while Peter, Peter doubted himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius 
made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and, and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, lodged there. And while Peter thought on the vision, so he's still up on the roof. In those days, if you're not familiar, the, a flat roof is common, which is a dumb thing to do in an area that rains. But a flat roof in there, it never rains there anyway. But uh, they'd have a little, a little wall around it to keep people from falling off. That's part of Old Testament law. You can't have a, a place people stumble off. Um, and so he's up there on the roof, and he's thinking about this vision. What in the world is God trying? He still didn't believe Gentiles could get saved. So he says there um, in verse uh, 20, Arise therefore and get thee down and go to them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent to him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. Uh, what is the cause? Wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, one that feared God, and of good report among the, all the nations of the Jews, was warned by, of God, from God by a holy angel to send for thee to his house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Now, so let's stop for a minute. He's on the roof. The vision comes down three times. All these unclean animals, the Lord says, what I've cleansed, don't you call common. Don't you call unclean. Three men come from Cornelius' house and uh, go up knocking on the door. They didn't say they knocked. They were calling out. We're looking for Simon Peter. And he says, I'm he. What do you need? And they told the story. And now they're on their way back down to, to uh, down. Our map would be up from Joppa, um, but it's down because of the other side of the world. Uh, they're going up to, uh, to Caesarea. Now, look over what happens next. We're going to stop for a minute. The whole story there finishes. Peter goes to Jerusalem talking to the Jewish leaders, and they wanted to know, what are you doing talking to Gentiles? And what are you doing getting involved with Gentiles? This is James and John. This is the rest of the apostles. Remember, the Christians were scattered everywhere but the apostles. And so they're all in Jerusalem, and in chapter 11, they're scolding Peter. So Peter retells the story. I want to point out one little phrase as he retells the story. Uh, look over to chapter 11 and verse 13 and 14. And he showed us how he had seen an angel. I'm in chapter 11, verse 13. He showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thy house may be, shall be what? Saved. So Cornelius' workers, the, rec the recording in chapter 10, didn't tell that part. He'll tell you how to get saved. It's very important that in chapter 11, it's established Cornelius was not saved. He was devout. He prayed. He gave money. He worshiped God. He was, had a good reputation among the Jewish people, the people of God. He was smart enough to know the Jews mattered to God. Would we have Congress that was smart enough to know the Jews mattered to God? And um, so he knew all that stuff, but you know what? He was lost. Cornelius was on his way to hell. He prayed always. Now, if you want to witness to a, let's say you want to witness to a Catholic friend or family member or a very religious friend, this is the place to go. Just show them religion doesn't save you. This is a very good man. He got the attention of God. His devotion, his longing for God got God's attention, but it did not save him. And when you're out soul winning, you're out witnessing to people, maybe at lunch, on the job, in the neighborhood. When you're out there, be very careful that you don't think because somebody's going to church that they're saved. And you got to be gracious about it. You know, you go up to somebody, you knock at the door, hi, how you doing? We're from Faith Baptist Church. I just want to give an invitation to our church. And, and uh, I will typically do that. I at least want the track in their hand. And then I may step back because I don't want to interrupt anything and, and uh and if they, they're standing there, then I'm going to stand there. If they're closing the door, I may try to say something. But, but at that point, I might say, by the way, do you go to church anywhere? I kind of turn like I'm leaving. I want to disarm them. I don't want them to think I'm there for an hour. 
and uh, they're busy, and I don't want to. I don't want. I don't want to. I don't want to bother them, but I do want to get them saved. And you know, go, you go to church anywhere? Oh yeah, I go to such and such church. You know, the big, you know, the 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 Hail Mary Church or the Rock and Roll Church or whatever church. And uh, and oh, I'm glad you're in church somewhere. And I would, if they're still there, I might just say, hey, I just had a question. You know, I grew up. My my mom was a very faithful Lutheran. My dad, um, in his younger years, very faithful Catholic. And uh, we had a good home, a lot of respect for God and the Bible. And I said, I just wonder, um, if you died today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? And I'll just ask him like that. Or would you have some doubts? And I add the would you have some doubts because no one wants to say, no, I'm going to hell. So if I say, now, it's not wrong to do that. This Pastor Blue, Pastor Blue led so many people uh, to Christ, and, and he had his methods. And, and uh, Pastor Treber, I heard Brother Treber talking about leading people to Christ and he said, many times, I'll ask someone, if you died today, will you, are you for sure you go to heaven or would you go to hell? And he look, he says, I look down. I just stay looking down. <laughs> Whatever you want to do is good for that. But um, I, I'd ask him, if you died today, do you know for sure you go to heaven or would you have some doubts? I want them, I, I want them to, to be comfortable saying, you know, I do have doubts. Oh, really? Well, and, and I would say something like this. Well, look, if, if you could know for sure, would you want to know? And if they said, no, man, you know what? I like beer. And when I die, I want to go to hell with my buddies and drink beer with my buddies. I may try to keep, and I've heard that. And I may keep talking to them, may not. That, you just got to see what God leads you to do. But um, so I'm talking to this person. And I might just say, well, let me just, and, I'll, and they have the track. And I said, let me, let me take that tr track back and show it to you. Now, I cannot see what this says. That, that is, um, Rachel probably made this track. Um, young people, right? Compliment you. Good. It's good to compliment the secretary. Young people make tracks that have, you, know, you have to have a magnifying glass to read. But I know what it says. And so I'd show them there's a problem. The problem all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And you under, I don't know about you, and I'll say it just like this. I don't know about you, but I know I'm a sinner. You know you're a sinner? Oh, yeah, I know I'm a sinner. And, and sometimes we'll just stop there and reminisce. But uh, not, not really. And, uh, and, and I'll just go through the gospel with them. Now, but you've got to be careful. If you're, if you're not careful, they'll say, oh, yeah, I go to the, I'm, I'm the lead guitarist. I'm the drummer. I'm the, I, you know, I'm the lead. I'm a, I, I just heard today in a sermon, a guy, the guy said, uh, I'm a part of the praise team. And the preacher said, I didn't, I didn't know praise was a team sport. <laughs> That's Sam Gipp. I'll listen to one of his sermons. He'll be here in a couple of weeks. He's hilarious. Uh, he is so good. But anyway, so. Um, but, you know, if you're not careful, you'll just say, well, that's good. God bless you. And you're going to leave him going to hell. And you can't do that. It, it, we have the obligation to, to help them know how to get saved. And so Acts chapter 10 is so key. Understand this man was lost. He was a good man, a religious man. It didn't say anything about church, but he prayed always he had a great testimony. He gave money. I'm thinking he was a pretty good man. I'd like him as my next door neighbor. And so we've got the story here. So let's just, just we're not going to finish. We're going to stop right here. But look with me down at chapter, um, chapter uh, 10, verse 20. Chapter 10 and verse 20. So the three men, arise therefore, get thee down. So Peter's leaving, verse 21. Peter went down with them, verse 22. Uh, they said, Cornelius, this just man, let's catch up to where we were. Verse 25. Then he called them in, lodged them, um, and on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Now, brethren from Joppa. So what are they? Saved or not saved? They're saved. So he's in Joppa with some Christians. And these three guys who are not Christians come down to from Caesarea, to Joppa, and Peter and these Christians go back with them up to Caesarea. Verse 10, on the morrow, after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. He knew how long it'd take to get there. He knew Peter would come. He had that vision. He just knew it. This guy believed. He really believed. He had a heart, but he was still lost. Verse 25, and Peter is coming in. Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet to worship him. Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. 
And he talked with him and went in and found many that were come together. He had his family members and friends say, well, you're going to hear some news from God. This guy had, a, had an influence. Let me just say this. Your friends are, are the best prospects. And um, when you're, you that have been in our church 20 years, all your friends are here. We don't know anybody that's not here. We got to just go out and beat the bushes for strangers. But you that are newer, you know people that we don't know. Your neighbors, your coworkers, uh, that's, that's who we should be seeking. And so Cornelius had all these people gathered together. And he had the preacher show up there. And um, so here Peter is. And in verse 28, and he said unto them, you know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. That's a pretty good statement, isn't it? The vision of the, of the beasts, and God said what I call common, that's where that word common came from that Peter used. In the end of verse 28, that common, that's the word that he used earlier. Look over there um, when the uh, vision came down. In verse uh, 11, um, I'm sorry, verse uh, 12, and we're all manner of four foot, uh, there we go, verse 14, there we go, verse 14. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice that spake to him again the second time said, what God hath cleans that call not thou common. And then we read about common over here in the end of verse 28. That's a key phrase. Um, you know, there's nobody that's not important. And... Uh, the sad thing is, we've got a bunch of crazies who don't understand that this is the book that will teach us to love our neighbor. We don't need the government to make laws. You can't make me like anybody. That is the dumbest thing in the world. All you can make me do is make me mad. But if we go out soul winning, we could teach people to love their neighbor. If we'd go out soul winning, we'd teach people, you know what, we're all of one blood. We're, we, we all belong together. And, uh, and that's what he's talking about. There's nobody common. That guy on the street, that homeless guy, he matters just as much as you or me. It's so very important that we call no man common. And, and Peter says, I, God showed me. There's nobody common. Now, we're going to stop here in Acts, but I want you to flip over, hold your place, and look over to Galatians chapter 2. Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians. We're going to do the rest of Acts in, in uh, next week, but um, Acts chapter 10, not the whole rest of the book, but uh, we don't have time for that. Look at Galatians chapter 2. So did Peter learn that there are no men that are common? All right, Galatians chapter 2. You, some of you know where I'm going, right? Galatians chapter 2 and uh, verse 11. Galatians 2 verse 11. But Peter was come to Antioch. That's the same Peter who stood up to Cornelius and said, God showed me to not call any man common. We're all the same. We all belong together. Now you bring fried chicken and potato salad out, we're having a church picnic. It doesn't matter, all right? Um, verse 11 of, of Galatians. Galatians 2, verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, by the way, this is some years later. Peter was come to Antioch. And I withstood him to the face, the Apostle Paul says, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, that's James in Jerusalem, James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision of the Jews. Verse 13, and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried about with their dissimulation. And then in verse 14 and following, Paul the Apostle just chews Peter out. Now, important lesson. Acts chapter 10, Peter got the truth. A few chapters later, quite a ways later in Acts, James is killed. So somewhere between there and I think it's chapter 16 and 10, somewhere in here, they get the gospel up to um, Antioch, and Peter's there. And Peter learned back here that everybody's the same. But up here, 
he's hanging out with his Gentile friends. They're having fried chicken and boiled okra, or fry, fried okra. Boiled okra is pretty disgusting. And uh, sushi and whatever else. And uh, pancit and uh, lumpia. And um, these guys come from Jerusalem, these Jewish guys, big shots. And, and somebody comes and says, hey, Peter, the apostles are coming. Oh, what a man, I'm around a bunch of Gentiles. And he takes off away from the table. A couple other Jews see him. They leave the table. Barnabas, Paul's soul-winning partner. Barnabas runs off, and they all leave. And Paul stands up and in front of everybody says, What's wrong with you? Here's our point. Very good people do forget. And very good people do make mistakes. Um, you, know, you say to your kid, I told you, yeah, but you're going to need to tell him again. I told you 100 times, try 104. And your husband's still not going to listen. This is a very good man who stood and proclaimed the unity of the people. And he, the, by the way, they're not saved yet. But these, these unsaved Gentiles, they're not dogs. They matter. And then however long, and I might be able to figure out how long, I don't know how long, but sometime later, he's in Antioch. That's this key place where the, the church, they were first called Christians. And, and he just messed up. Messed up enough to be scolded publicly. Boy, how would that go over in church here? And I'm not talking about the church down the road. I mean, if I just called out somebody's name and said, look, they've been. We just don't do that, all right? Because we're better Christians than that. We're not better Christians than the Apostle Paul. But I would ask you, we'll finish this next week. <clears throat> I would ask you to have mercy. Your kid's going to mess up. Um, have a measure of grace. Because... Good people say dumb things. And I think if you'd have cornered Peter and said, is it a problem to eat with them? He'd have said, no, I just kind of worry about what people think of me. He said, well, a good Christian shouldn't be worried about what people think of them. No, they shouldn't, but they do. So don't, don't, you know, don't flip out and go crazy because you found out somebody has a weakness. We're all just a bunch of dirt. All right, let's pray. Father, bless us today. Thank you for this book. What an amazing book. And a, a book, who would write a book that reveals their own weaknesses? But uh, this unbelievable book that points out uh, the frail and the, the boisterous Peter and the, and the denying of his Savior, Peter. And, and uh, what a great man that you lifted up and used. So help us, help us to... Help us to work at this thing and get in the gospel to everybody, that there is nobody unclean. Everybody needs to hear. And the church ought to have everybody in it and welcome to it. And, and, uh, and when we stumble and have our moments that we don't handle, maybe we're not as gracious as we ought to be to somebody in a business relationship or some awkward moment when our flesh comes out and we say some things we ought not say. Oh, may the rest of us have mercy on those of us who are human. And we just thank you for using sinners, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you. Have a great night and uh, soul winning this week. And if you're